Hello everyone, my name is Johannes Dienst. Normally I hold this talk with Carsten Hoffmann, a colleague of mine. Combined we have an experience of over five years of real DevOps in our corporate environment and we learned two things you might want to hear about because they can help you develop better services, implement uh, faster and be happier in your team. So let's get it on. The table of contents is very small today because I only have 20 minutes. So we start with an origin story, where we come from, what we really mean by doing DevOps. And then we jump right into the problems we faced, which were quite different, but the same for both our teams, namely knowledge silos and documentation. So where do we come from? We come from a company called Deutsche Bahn. Um, a subsidiary of it is DB Systel, where we both work for in different teams. And since 2018 and before, we are the digital partner of Deutsche Bahn. We are driving the digitalization of the Deutsche Bahn. And in 2018, there came a mind shift. We had development and ops separated. And then we said, okay, it's better better to develop services and produce them in the DevOps production model. So what do we mean by DevOps production model? Yeah, DevOps is um, pretty easy, but everybody <laughs> understands something different from it. We understand at DBS is still about DevOps. It's, it means you build it, you run it. And this is really, we're talking to the customers especially in my team, we're talking to the customers and uh, hear what they want from us. And then we implement our service. We are bringing it, bringing it, it to production and we are taking it into operation. I'm developing in my team uh, a product called DB Content Hub, which is a CMS, a headless CMS uh, with an API on the platform that uh, the team of Carsten Carsten Hoffmann um, provides named the Business Hub, which is basically an API management platform. And they're also doing it in DevOps production model. So they bring some features in production and run it. And it's interesting, when we prepared the talk, we discovered that <laughs> we had the same problems. So it's interesting. And then we said, okay, we prepare this talk and we he, these two, two problems were the main problems we faced namely knowledge silos silos and documentation. Also, let's start with the knowledge silos and start with Carsten's team. Carsten's team um, was hacking away happily at the start and uh, then everybody was using their own tools. And um, they discovered, oh yeah, everybody's using their own tools and uh, own tools doesn't mean uh, IDEs but really the tools, the frameworks. For example, there were enterprise architect for documentation. There were Draw for documentation. There was a Visio for documentation. There were different build systems altogether. Maven, Gradle, different languages, JavaScript, Kubernetes, um, JavaScript, Python, Java. Different platforms they deployed to Kubernetes and OpenShift. And this created a big problem because everyone wrote code that other team members couldn't maintain. And if you're in a small team and someone fails, for example, someone gets ill, gets sick, then the others couldn't provide the service he provided. And if you're uh, in production and have to fix a bug and you can't fix a bug because you don't know the tools, that's a really big problem. So they had a tool explosion on this side. We had a tool explosion on the IDE side. So for example, um, so we were five developers and everybody used their own IDEs. So there was one Sublime guy, he is a little bit older, though he uses Sublime, but he's very proficient with it and, and very productive. Then we had two Intelli IntelliJ guys, which uh, were me and a colleague. And um, we also had uh, two guys with um, Vicious Studio Code background uh, with JavaScript background and they used Visual Studio Code, which, all, which is all fine. Yeah, they all do the same thing. But on top of that, we also had the same tool explosion of uh, like Carsten's team. Like we had JavaScript, TypeScript and Java. And that's not as much as 
es Carsten Stevens, but it was is much if you work in a DevOps team. And then we had for documentation four formats: Draw IO for diagrams. Then we had ASCII doc. We had also Markdown in our repositories, and sometimes you also used Word and sometimes a wiki. I haven't mentioned it there because wiki is a little bit like ASCII doc and Markdown. So, and what we discovered was there is a high mental load. And there's also a high mental load if you're the one sublime user and your IDE is not functioning as, as uh, expected. So the IntelliJ, IntelliJ or Visual Studio Code guys can't help you. That's okay. But you have to deal with problems in your IDE alone. That's a problem. That's a real problem. And also the context switching is very, very high. So if you're programming JavaScript, and Java, and TypeScript. And then you're documenting ASCII doc and sometimes Markdown. You also have to remember so many things. And for example, ASCII doc is a little bit similar to Markdown, but different. So you have to context switch all the time in, in languages. And th this creates a high mental workload. And finally, we also discovered we had a lot of legacy code, <laughs> legacy documentation, because our work ba base became unmaintainable. Yeah. So what do we do? What did we do about it? And we came to the same conclusions. In Carsten's team, the, the team came to the conclusion. So we are producing artifacts and everybody should be able to produce these artifacts, for example, documentation or tests. So everything that produces an artifact should be a team decision, finally. And they decided, okay, perhaps we want to use Enterprise Architect, but it's not good if somebody can't use Enterprise Architect. So it's always a team decision, what we use for documentation, because this creates an artifact, or what we use for test. So they decided, okay, DrawU is for documentation, ASCII doc is our, is our markup or markdown language and we have rest assured for tests. There were many more tool decisions they made, but this is the basics. And we didn't um, went the same way in our team, but we came to the same, uh, to a different but same conclusion. Okay, we have all these different IDEs. That's okay, it's, it's fine. Everybody should use their own IDE. But if you're producing tests, for example, then you have to produce this in the most basic technique that is available. And the most basic technique available, for example, we are, we are developing an API, which is hosted on, on the uh, API platform of Carson's team. Then we are doing API calls. And the most basic technique for API calls is curl, so bash. And we put all these example code in curl in curl calls and everybody can use the bash um, and then we're fine. If you want to use your own tools, like for example, Postman or plugins for your IDE, that's totally fine, no problem. But you have to create it on your own from bash. And what we also discovered is, okay, um, no project files of IDEs in the repository. So we created an git ignore, uh, which rejects project files. And that's it. That was our solution for it. And as Carsten's, um, okay, we, we have one tool for one job, we came up with the most basic technique, which is practically the same. Then in a DevOps team, should you document? I would say, yes, you should document. But and everybody feels that way. And documentation is all sometimes a drag especially in a corporate environment. Why is it a drag in, the docu in, in a corporate environment? Yeah, the corporate environment um, urges us to use Word. We have to use Word. And we have templates for architecture documentation, for example. That's fine, but the templates are often bloated. And so you fill in a lot of information you might not need. So you have bloated Word documents with information you need and a lot of information you might not need. And that's uh, not very pleasant to work with, especially if, we, especially if you want to move fast. So um, that's one problem. There's another problem. It's not linkable. 
you can put the links in Word, but you also have to download the Word to view it. So links in Word do not really work out the way it should be, not the way you think about it in HTML, for example. So, okay, you have an interface definition and it costs another interface to fulfill its job. So you have to download the Word. That's not very cool to work with. Also, I can rant about Visivik uh, edit editors uh, all day long, but they every time I touch a Visivik editor and Kastner showed me, <laughs> he feels the same way. It just doesn't do what you expect it to do. For example, if you have a heading and you press enter, then the new line, sometimes it's also a heading and sometimes it's standard and it's not deterministic. So editing um, a word or for example, a wiki is, is very tedious over Visivik because sometimes you just trash the document and it's gone. This can't happen with, for example, text-based text -based editing languages like Markdown or Asking Doc. And also versioning. Versioning um, documentation is in Word is a pain. You, you can't do it. Perhaps you have a system who can do it, but it's not automatic. Um, you, you can't automate it most of the time because there should be an API for this tool and this tool, often these tools don't have an API for it. So we decided, okay, if we need to put, uh, have an output word, then that's okay. We cre can create it, but we don't want to use word as our main documentation language. That's what we both came up with. So what do we do now? There's an old new approach for me. It's, uh, a little bit older because I uh, use it for two years now. It's called the docs as code approach. So you treat your docs like code and it's code is basically text. So you, I'm pretty sure everybody of you knows Markdown, but we came up with a solution. We said we want to use ASCII doc. Why won't we use ASCII doc? Markdown has a problem called standard. It's a very small standard markdown and ASCII doc has a very rich standard and there's basically only one standard. And if you have a small standard, like a small specification, like markdown, everybody creates their own flavor and the flavors don't interoperate very well because they are own flavors. And that's not a problem with ASCII doc. ASCII doc, every, every ASCII doc implementation is the same because there's only one specification and it's feature rich. That's cool. You can copy ASCII doc everywhere and it works. So ASCII doc is a cool cho uh, choice. There's another feature called includes. We have a technical architecture documentation Arc for, in Arc 42, for example. If we need a glossary in a user documentation, for example, then if you have a word, you have to copy it. You can't include it. ASCII doc has this cool feature where you can modularize your documentation and with this modularization, you can say, okay, if I need a user documentation and I need this glossary from the ARC42 doc, technical architecture documentation, yeah, then it's fine. I just use the include phrase. And when the ASCII doc gets rendered into an HTML or PDF or whatever format you like, then this gets included and it looks like it is in this document, but you only have to um, gardening it in one place. That's a major plus. It has includes. Doc. And also the tooling. The tooling got better in the last two years, namely because of plugins. In Visual Studio Code, for example, you have a very cool uh, ASCII doc plugin. Uh, I use IntelliJ mainly, and it has a um, ASCII doc plugin which is beyond <laughs> everything. It has uh, autocomplete functionality, preview uh, functionality. Um, it's ASCII doc feels like a development language if you use the IntelliJ plugin. So highly recommended. Just Google ASCII doc plugin from Alexander Schwarz. And if you treat docs as code, then it's text-based and you put your docs into a Git repository, for example, and then it's easily versionable and the versioning is also automatable. Let that sink in. It's automatable. 
every time you push something to production, you can create a new version by a tag, for example, or by a new commit. And you can check that out easily. Just check out the tag. It's, it's already there. Git gives you everything you need. So that's a major plus. You don't have to have to do this versioning alone. So how does um, this integrate in our workflow? Yeah, I already mentioned it's it's um, modularized, modularizable. And what we do at, uh, in Carson's team, they do it extensively. They say, okay, we put every documentation where the code is. So we have different Git repositories and put the documentation where the code is. And in our team, we didn't start there. We all put all our documentation in one place. But uh, now we are writing operations manual and discover that it's better to put the documentation, for example, for the deployment of a service or for deployment of an artifact into the repository itself. We decided, oh, okay, we, we put the documentation also in the Git repositories where the code is. And it's pretty easy to create an overarching repository, the one here. Uh, on the left side and just check out in the build process the sub modules for example the git sub modules and then include them in the ASCII doc that's pretty easy and if we do this we can create all sorts of documentation and renders in all sorts of formats and there's one um, one open source tool called doc toolchain there are other open source tools like Pandoc, for example. We use Doc Toolchain and GitLab CI CD to create all different formats of, of our documentation. So if we need a word, there's no problem. Doc Toolchain can create a word. Or if you need a PDF, you can also style your um, ASCII doc uh, in your corporate CI CD, no problem, and create a PDF from it. It looks like it was created from Word. and a third approach is we use to create um, a microsite, HTML site from our documentation. And Carsten does this, this is as well. He doesn't use the microsite, they use a, a homebrew, um, homebrew framework, but it does the same. Don't bother, it's in German, but you will understand what it means. Um, you, and you can create an HTML site with GitLab CI CD and GitLab pages with a static site generator. And this uh, static site generator has um, a lot of great features, namely it creates HTML and a little bit of JavaScript. It's blazingly fast to create an up-to-date version. You can automate it with GitLab CI, so every time the new production version comes out, uh, out of the documentation changes, the microsite gets rendered at you, and then you have all your documentation in one place as an HTML site. And an HTML site is highly accessible. Everybody can read it. It's not like a Word document in some obscure system and nobody can find it. An HTML site, if you integrate it in your internal search, which we have at DBSSTL, it's um, um, Deutsche Bahn wide uh, search engine, it's integrated with a search bot and the search bot just crawls it. It's a, uh, basically a, a web crawler and it's the index um, of the search site. You can find our documentation easily if you just type in, for example, DB Content Hub, the product we develop. And everybody has a browser and everybody can read it. So if you're doing documentation, this docs is code and with a microsite, um, you get a lot of benefits out of it. So I'm already at the end. Uh, to recap, we, we talked, I talked about knowledge silos and how you can conquer them. Remember, everything that creates an artifact should be a team decision or you use the most basic technique like in our team. And if you're docu doing documentation in a DevOps team, please use docs as code. It has so many benefits then I can't even name it. I don't want to go back to Word. So this was it. Um, you learned something you can immediately apply 
and I hope you enjoyed it.